it didn't work. I ended up having contractions upon contraction upon contraction. So they took the medication, said, we're just going to give you a C-section. So I was a little nervous about major surgery, but I said, okay. We went in. Everything was fine. My son was perfect. The, everything was like textbook. My doctor was like marveling at how everything looked in there. I mean, he just went on and on about everything. And they, you know, closed my incision. And my son was actually born to an infection, so he was in the NICU. So we went up after two days to uh, see him. And I remember very clearly standing up to look at him in the incubator. And I felt kind of like a popping sensation near my incision. And I looked at my husband and I said, I need to go, something's wrong. I went down and back to my room, was starting to feel really lightheaded. And um, the nurse, who was kind of kooky, said, oh, I think you just need to lay down and breathe deeply and we'll turn the lights out. It's probably nothing. So then they brought in med students who tried to diagnose me with gas. And I said, I said, not gas. And it, it's, I'm in a severe pain at this point. My OB came in, took one look at me. I was apparently gray white and put his hand on my stomach and said, she has a hematoma underneath her incision that's the size of a softball. So he did an ultrasound and found out that I had an arterial bleed. Um, so I ended up having to have a second surgery. And then after that surgery, they didn't want to close my incision because they were afraid it was going to happen again. So I had a wound back, which I do not recommend to anyone. It's horrible, but I had it for four days and then finally had the incision closed. And then we took my son home, and there he is. And uh, we took him home and kind of resumed life. But when I went in for my six-week check, my OB said, "Do you want to have any more kids? If you do, you should probably do it sooner rather than later because you're not getting getting any younger." And which I was only 34, so I don't know what he said that. But um, he, you know, he just kind of said. You're going to have a heart attack probably at some point. Again, we don't know if it's going to happen when you're pregnant or when you're not pregnant. So just kind of get it out of the way. So we decided to start when my son was a year trying to have another baby. And four months after that, which was a little bit sooner than we thought it would happen, um, I got pregnant again and again had a normal pregnancy. Everything was fine. And at that same marker, 38 weeks and two days, went in for my test and had high blood pressure. So they said, you're having a baby. <laughs> And we were thankfully a little bit more prepared this time. And um, she was born, she was fine, no infection. She was perfect. She was teeny little peanut, five pounds, 12 ounces. And we, it was just perfect. And then that day, I went back to my room and was recovering from my C-section. And the nurse was um, examining my incision, and I started feeling really lightheaded. Had um, about four nurses. A bunch of doctors came in, anesthesiology was in, they were like arguing, telling them I was having a heart attack, and I remember very clearly lying <laughs> in the bed with my head elevated up and saying, I'm not having a heart attack. I know I'm not having a heart attack. And they looked at me like it was crazy. I said, I have had four heart attacks. I am not having a heart attack. And they finally believed me and said, oh, but something's wrong. So they did another ultrasound, and I ended up um, having more bleeding. But thankfully, at this time, it wasn't arterial, so they said we're just going to wait and see what happens. And after two days, the bleeding stopped. They still had me on um, having what they think happened, or not, still not 100% sure, it was that they switched me back to my fluid in too soon. And so it just caused me to have bleeding. And so I went for my six week check and decided I'm not going to have any more kids because <laughs> it's a little dangerous. And I have my two, and that's my. So, so she's my doctor. But, um, so, um, since my diagnosis, I did meet with Dr. Neuberger in Boston at Boston Children's, and she has always encouraged me to be as active as possible because she did, as Dr. Burns mentioned, that your heart. I know I have to have bypass surgery at some point, but your heart can kind of make its own, you know, ways, and so. I've been very active. I was a runner. I was a cheerleader when I was in high school and then in college as much. And then since having my kids, um, have you know been working out pretty consistently three to five times a week. And then six weeks after my daughter was born, I decided that I had a crazy idea that I would like to run a half marathon. And I had exactly 10 weeks to train for it. And I did it. I finished. I was not fast, but I did finish. And I ran the whole time. That was my only goal. 
and I say it's my first half because I hope to do another one at some point, but I just maintain my, my lifestyle, and you know, a lot of people have asked me questions of, you know, aren't you afraid that the big part is coming, or aren't you afraid of this, and you know, I can't, I've never lived my life as being afraid, it's kind of, you know, I have the motto of like, how it's like a disease, it's something that happened, and at this point, I'm 20 years old, my aneurysms are still the same size, um, that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, but I can't put my life on hold. And I obviously have two beautiful children that <laughs> I love. They drive me crazy. But I have a new perspective now, too, because I've always been the Katie kid. And now I'm the Katie kid that has her kids. And so whenever my children are sick, my, my head goes to the so I can see. And I'm, you know, looking over my daughter. She has a rash or, you know, they have a fever, watching the fever. And so I understand and I sympathize with all of you because now I'm there and I understand it's very, very scary. So um, I just also, you know, one of the things that recently that has been affecting me, um, because I'm on food and all the other medications, if I get sick, I can't take anything other than Benadryl, I can't take ibuprofen, you know, I have to take just Tylenol and, and you know, all these things. And the one thing that is um, kind of affecting me mostly, and I think as we're getting to have more adults, is simple things that, like birth control. There are so many birth control pills that you can't take if you're on coming in. And I'm actually talking with my cardiologist and OB at this point because there's, you know, obviously we don't want any more children, but there are so many things that are, that can affect me in a, in a certain way. And so that's something that, I know we don't want to think about it as parents, but your children are going to have to deal with, with birth control at some point in their lives. And I mean, to not have as many options as a normal person, and to, I mean, it's something that's going to affect me for the next 20 years or so. So that's that's kind of at what's going on in my head right now. But as far as, you know, just my life is as normal as can be, you know, occasionally I have a little blip on the, you know, as I go to call where I end up um, having a, a little MI, tiny minor. Um, but I go back to my life, and if anything, it kind of gives me a little bit more of a push to keep going and to talk. And, you know, I joined the board of the Kelsey Disease Foundation in the like, 08, I think, and basically because there has been no voice for kids, because the kids are young. And so I've had so many parents say, you are the person that I look to. I've had a lot of say, especially after I had my children, well, now I know that it's a possibility that my kids can have kids, or now I know that they can live a normal life. And I certainly don't view myself any sort of role model, but it's nice that I can give some parents a peace of mind that their child's life is not going to be affected forever by this. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Burns and the team, because without people like you, I mean, there would be no symposiums, there would be nothing, and the people like me who are older, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we, I really appreciate it on a personal level, but also, you know, for the younger kids that are out there.